Hypothetically speaking, if I won the lottery, the first thing that I would do is start making a live action adaptation of the book Cinder. I think I would want to make it a movie just because selfishly I do want to see this on the big screen. I would be directing, casting, and starring in this film. Director because I want to be overseeing everything. I would also invite the author Marissa to come along and help me with this journey. Casting because I don't want other people to butcher the, the casting of these characters. I feel like I know them well enough. Plus, if I had like loads and loads of money and this was like my own passion project, I wouldn't need to get big names involved for the sake of getting big names involved. You know what I mean? And starring because in a delusional sort of sense, I believe that I am Cinder. I've actually been doing a lot of videos on, you know, books lately. I guess this is my formal uh, offer to become a member of booktube. I even made a video last week about the selection TV show, the first episode, the pilot, if you will. So if you want to go check that out, please do. I, it would mean a lot to me. But you best believe my adaptation would be better than that monstrosity. I'm just saying. Funny story, when I was having my quarter life crisis in high school and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, I got into acting. And the reason that I got into acting was because if they were to make a live action adaptation of Cinder, I would want to be in the running to play her. To repeat, the reason that I got into acting was not because I enjoyed the crap, not because I wanted to be famous or get like rich or anything like that. It was because I wanted to have the acting credentials necessary to realistically be in the running to play Cinder if and when the time came <laughs> for the movie or TV show to be cast. And actually, you know what? Through my acting journey, I ended up starring in two different short films. Don't ask me how, because I couldn't tell you. Physically speaking, I think I am a shoe in Age 16, I'm 20, but you know what? Same thing. Race, Asian, Caucasian mix, that is me. Tan skin, I'm not that tan right now. I can get tan, or look at this picture. Those are two totally different skin colors. Trust me, I can get there. Eye color brown, yes. Hair color slash style, straight, fine, brunette. Yes, just below the shoulders. I can cut it. Often wears messy ponytails. That can be arranged. Build five foot eight. I actually am five foot eight, believe it or not. Slender, few curves, almost boyish. Who needs boobs? Wait, this is the vision, okay? Hey. Someone order a mechanic. If I maybe had a different face, was Tanner, had the ability to act, I think like it's safe to assume that I should just be waiting for the casting call. I probably should have just dressed like this the whole video. Whoops. If you don't think I'm Cinder, what was that? I <laughs> I can't hear you. But anyway, before we really get into it, I'd love to talk about the sponsor of today's video, which is Toon Blast. Toon Blast is a free to play mobile game available on all devices where you have to solve puzzles by blasting cubes and creating powerful combos to pass levels. There are over 7,000 of these fun levels, but don't be alarmed. It's easy to learn and you'll get the hang of it in no time. I actually know someone who has made it to level 8,251, so it's possible. By doing so, you can help the Toon gang travel around magical worlds. There are also many fun and challenging mini games you can play to claim rewards, or if you're less of a solo player, you can join a team to work with other players and unlock awesome rewards. The more active your team is, the more lives and coins you'll earn. You can even compete against other players around the world in challenging events to win great prizes. My favorite thing about Toon Blast personally is that you don't need Wi-Fi to play the game. You can play anywhere, anytime, and there are no ads. So usually I play Toon Blast in the car when I'm passenger princessing. So here's my progress right now I'm on level 31. I recommend like really going for the power-ups like if you put if you press these two right here BAM look at that when I find that I'm struggling in level it's because I'm not like using enough of those combo moves yeah! Toon Blast has millions of reviews and high ratings on the App Store and Google Play. So come and join the fun, y'all! Download Toon Blast for free now by using the link in my description slash pinned comment. Or scan the QR code on the screen to receive three hours of unlimited lives and a hundred free coins. Thank you so much to Toon Blast for sponsoring this video, and now let's get into Cinder! I have such a spiritual connection to this book. So a little bit of backstory here. Cinder takes place in the future, mainly were centered in China right now. In New Beijing to be exact, there is like an emperor sort of political regime. That's what's going on right there. So since it's in the future, obviously the political climate is slightly different. Another new thing is that there is a whole civilization on the moon. It's called Luna and there's a society of lunar people and lunars are kind of like people except they have this ability to manipulate bioelectricity. And so these lunars can like manipulate people to see things, to feel things. That's 
sort of thing. The Lunars that are unable to do that are called shells, so they can't manipulate people, and on the flip side, Lunars can't manipulate shells. So that's where this story is taking place right now, and our main character is Miguel Cinder. She has a stepmom and two stepsisters, Pearl and Peony. She does not get along with Pearl, but she is low-key besties with Peony. Her stepmother, Audrey, hates her guts in part because Cinder is a cyborg, so she has like a lot of metal, not real parts, and cyborgs are sort of treated as second-class citizens in this society. Cinder is also a mechanic, and our story takes place when she's working in her mechanic booth in the market. And see, one of the other reasons why I feel spiritually connected to Cinder is because the day that she and Kai met is the day after my birthday, and that cannot possibly be a coincidence. Cinder had just gotten the money to buy a new foot for herself. The foot that she had been using is way too small for her, her like metal foot, because she is in fact a cyborg like I mentioned. And so she's kind of sitting there waiting for her new foot to arrive, and so she only has one foot, and guess who comes waltzing towards her booth? Prince Kai. He goes to her because he heard that she was like one of the best mechanics around and he asks her to fix his android Nancy who has this like top secret information about Princess Selene and Kai has been researching Princess Selene because he low-key high key wants to dethrone Queen Lavana, who's the queen of the Lunars on Luna. Okay so I forgot to mention a lot of things. A Prince Kai is the prince of the Commonwealth which is where Cinder lives. I think it includes like China and other places. <laughs> That's very informative, I know. And B, Queen Lavana had a sister, Queen Canary, and Queen Canary had a daughter named Princess Selene. It is rumored that Queen Lavana killed uh, Queen Canary and Princess Selene. However, there are also rumors that Princess Selene didn't die and she is still like alive somewhere. Queen Canary is dead though, unfortunately, so that's the tea. However, he doesn't tell Cinder this at first because it's confidential, but Cinder can tell he's lying because every time someone lies, a little like orange light pops up in her vision. Automatically, there's some flirtatious vibes, obviously. Uh, Kai is kind of smitten for her off the bat for whatever reason. Cinder is kind of smitten with him off the bat for whatever reason. I mean, he's the prince, he's cute, has a charming smile. I can't blame the gal. The first thing she does when he tells her the android is broken is she smacks it hard upside the head and he's like, are you sure you're like, Lynn Cinder, the best mechanic. Anyway, he ends up leaving. Cinder gets her new replacement foot from... <sighs> I'm a little bit worried because I feel like the majority of people pronounce this name as Iko. In my head, I've always pronounced it as Eco for whatever reason, so I'm gonna call her Eco, and you're gonna have to deal with that. But then there's a little bit of a scandal. Chang Sasha from across the way, across the marketplace, gets ledumosis. So this disease is like the plague. Once someone gets it, there's no cure. They're going to die in a matter of days, I believe. And this plague is spreading across the world, and no one really knows like what's happening, what it is, why it's here. So anyway, Cinder goes home, and her stepsisters, Pearl and Peony, are getting fitted with these like luxurious ball gowns, and Cinder's like, oh, where's mine? And Audrey's like, you're not getting one. Oh no, because you can't attend the ball unless you like finish with my list of chores. So Cinder's a little bit upset, but not too surprised because, you know, Audrey never really lets her do anything. And even though she had just met the prince, like she's probably never gonna see him again, right? Cinder, Eco, and Peony end up going to the junkyard because Cinder needs to get some parts to fix their hover. And so at the junkyard, she's telling Peony all about her interaction with Prince Kai because Peony is like in love with Prince Kai and is really excited to see him at the ball. And while they're searching for like this mag belt piece, Cinder ends up finding this rusty orange car, which is like ancient at this point in time. Everybody uses hover cars, no one uses like actual cars like the ones that we have today. And Cinder sees this and she's like, wow, I'm gonna use this to escape eventually from Audrey in New Beijing and she's just going to run away using this car. That's her plan. Unfortunately, in the moonlight, she sees a little spot on Peony's like chest and that is the signal that Peony has the plague. It's very traumatizing for everybody involved. These androids go to take Peony away into the quarantines and Cinder thinks she's like, she's probably like, oh my God, I have the disease. But when she gets checked, when her blood gets checked, it turns out she doesn't have it. So she's like, that's weird. I thought that maybe I might've given it her from like the marketplace because Chang Sacha had the disease earlier, but who knows what's happening? Who knows why Peony got the disease? So Cinder goes home and obviously Audrey and Pearl are like horrified by this news. And because of this, Audrey is like, Cinder, I'm shipping you away for plague research. She, there's this cyborg draft going on because cyborgs are treated as like second class people 
they are being drafted for this plague research, but everybody who gets drafted dies. So essentially Audrey just shipped Cinder away to die after Peony was diagnosed. Cinder didn't go down without a fight though. Oh no, she was like smacking androids around like there's no tomorrow, which Loki there wasn't at the time. She gets to the research facilities in the palace. She meets this guy named Dr. Erland. After running some tests, the doctor comes in and he's like, Cinder girl, you're immune to the disease. And this comes as a shock because Cinder's like, oh my God, wow, I'm special. Like I'm, in, I'm immune to the disease. This is gonna help so many people. But Dr. Erland, he had some other sneaky plans in mind. He was looking at Cinder's x-rays. He could see all the different parts in her system. And one part in particular stood out to him, which was this little like shadow looking like thing on her neck so he went behind her and like gave it a little pinch a little zap and cinder falls to the ground in agony and when she comes to prince kai is standing over her very worried i may add he's like oh my god why is cinder like sweating in agony on the ground and the doctor's like oh no she's fine like it's it's fine and then he's like cinder have you fixed my android yet and she was like no i haven't gotten a chance to and then so she goes back home to fix the android one would think but she doesn't do that she immediately starts fixing her getaway car in a getaway car pearl and audrey were flabbergasted to say the least because cinder was supposed to die she wasn't supposed to come back and here she was walking into the room like nothing had fucking happened then the disease really starts taking its toll on everyone the emperor dies which means that kai is now set to become emperor very soon cinder went to visit peony in like the quarantines and she saw chang sacha die and she also saw these and Androids, like taking out the ID chips from everyone's wrists and like harvesting them and in this futuristic society everybody has ID chips to like identify oneself and she was slightly concerned about that but just like keep that in mind because that'll come up later she then goes back to the palace because Dr. Erlen's like girl you need to keep coming back for research purposes and she's taking the elevator down to the laboratories when none other than Prince Kai happens to go waltzing into her very elevator so they take the elevator down to the labs um, the two of them walk out and everybody around them's like Prince Kai like my condolences I'm so sorry and Cinder at this point finally realizes that the Emperor died which she didn't know that before because I guess she wasn't checking like the internet another piece of information that Cinder learned was that the Lunar Queen Queen Lavana was coming to the palace today so the two of them go to see Dr. Erlen and then right before Kai leaves he does something kind of spicy he says I know this sounds like very poor timing but trust me when I say my motives are based on self-preservation would you consider being my personal guest at the ball? To which Cinder replies, I don't know, I mean, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to the ball. Cinder, girl, please. Afterwards, Dr. Erland starts giving Cinder a little history lesson about Lunars, how some have escaped to Earth because Queen Lavana kills shells and like a lot of them don't agree with her rule. And then because they're talking about Lunars, Cinder was like, oh yeah, Kai told me that the queen was coming today and Dr. Erland's like, bitch, what? You need to leave. And Cinder's like, why do I need to leave? Like, what? why are you freaking out? And he's like, girl, I hate to break this to you, but you're Lunar and you're also a shell and Queen Lavana hates shells, so she's gonna wanna kill you. He's like, this is the whole reason why you're immune to the plague because Lunars are the ones that brought this over to Earth in the first place. I think this is also at this point where Dr. Erlen reveals to Cinder that he is in fact Lunar too, and that's how he knows all of this. So Cinder leaves, the queen arrives, and it's at this point that Cinder finally remembers the task that she was assigned to do at the very beginning of this book, which is to fix Kai's android. And so she does some rummaging around and figures out that someone inserted this DCOM chip, this direct communication chip, not Disney channel original movie chip and because it did it wasn't compatible with Nancy's system that's why she like shut down in the middle of whatever she was doing and when she figures out the problem Nancy comes back to life and starts repeating the information that she was telling Prince Kai originally and that's when Cinder finds out that he was looking for Princess Celine and she's like oh shoot so then despite Dr. Erlen's warnings Cinder goes back to the palace and she sees a bunch of people protesting outside of the palace and then eventually Queen Lavana comes out and she's looking at the crowd and everybody just like falls silent. They fall in awe with her. Cinder is among them and she kind of falls under Queen Lavana's trance as well until her cybernetic system kicks in and then snaps her out of the trance. And once she snaps out, she like visibly recoils and Queen Lavana catches sight of her and that was not 
good. So then Lavana goes back inside the palace and she's like, hi, you're harboring lunars, how dare you? Because she saw Cinder and thought she was a shell. But Cinder, at that point, she was actually questioning the fact whether she was a shell because she wasn't immune to Queen Lavana's charms at first. She was only able to break out of the spell because of something relating to her being a cyborg. So Cinder makes it to the palace gates and returns Nancy and wants to be let inside as well, but the guard won't let her. So Nancy's like, don't worry, girl, I'll tell Kai you're waiting outside. Meanwhile, Kai is meeting with Lavana and she is offering him a little exchange. She's like, dude, I have the antidote for letomosis. If you marry me, I will give you the antidote. And he was like, fuck, I don't want to marry you, but like, I got to do this for my people. At that point, the android comes waltzing in, Miss Nancy. And so Kai, because he's down bad, runs to meet Cinder outside. When they get together, Cinder tells Kai what was wrong with her. And Kai was like, oh shit, that chip is lunar. Like, I know that, I would know that material anywhere. And then he asks her to the ball again. Kai tilted his head, peering at her as if he could see right through to the metal plate in her head. The intensity of his gaze didn't mellow. I think you should go to the ball with me. She clutched her fingers. His expression was too genuine, too sure. Her nerves tingled. Stars, she muttered. Didn't you already ask me that? I'm hoping for a more favorable answer this time, and I seem to be getting more desperate by the minute. How charming. Kai's lips twitched. Please? Why? Why not? I mean, why me? Kai hooked his thumbs on his pockets. So if my escape hover breaks down, I'll have someone on hand to fix it? She rolled her eyes and found herself unable to look at him again, staring instead at the red emergency button beside the doors. I mean it, I can't go alone, and I really can't go with Lavana. Well, there are about 200,000 single girls in the city who would fall over themselves to have the privilege. A hush passed between them. He wasn't touching her, but she could feel his presence, warm and overpowering. She could feel the elevator growing hot, despite the fact that her temperature gauge assured her it hadn't changed. Cinder. She couldn't help it. She looked at him. Her defenses withered a bit upon encountering the openness in his brown eyes. His confidence had been replaced with worry, uncertainty. 200,000 single girls, he said. Why not you? Cyborg, lunar, mechanic, she was the last thing he wanted. She opened her lips and the elevator stopped. I'm sorry, but trust me, you don't want to go with me. The doors opened and the tension released her. She rushed out of the elevator, head down, trying not to look at the small group of people waiting for an elevator. Come to the ball with me, she froze. Everyone in the hallway froze. Cinder turned back. Kai was still standing in elevator B, one hand propping open the door. Her nerves were frazzled and all the emotions of the past hour were converging into a single sickening feeling, exasperation. The hall was filled with doctors, nurses, androids, officials, technicians, and they all fell into an awkward hush and stared at the prince and the girl in the baggy cargo pants he was flirting with. Flirting. Squaring her shoulders, she retreated back into the elevator and pushed him inside, not even caring that it was with her metal hand. Hold the elevator, he said to the android as the door shut them in. He smiled. That got your attention. Listen, she said, I'm sorry, I really am, but I can't go to the ball with you. You just have to trust me on that. He gazed down at the gloved hand splayed across his chest. Cinder pulled away, crossing her arms over her chest. Why? Why don't you want to go with me? She huffed. It's not that I don't want to go with you, it's that I'm not going at all. So you do want to go with me? Cinder locked her shoulders. It doesn't matter because I can't, but I need you. Need me? Yes. Don't you see? If I'm spending all my time with you, then Queen Levana can't rope me into any conversations or... He shuddered, dancing. Cinder reeled back, her gaze losing focus. Queen Levana. Of course this was about Queen Levana. What had Peony told her ages ago? Rumors of a marriage alliance? Not that I have anything against dancing. I can dance if you want to dance. She squinted at him. What? Or not, if you don't want to, or if you don't know how, which is nothing to be ashamed of. She ducked her head. Look, I know you're royalty and all, but people are probably getting really impatient for this Ella. Her breath snagged as Kai leaned forward. So close, she was sure for a heartbeat he meant to kiss her. She froze, a wave of panic crashing into her, and barely managed to look up. Instead of kissing her, he whispered, Imagine there was a cure, but finding it would cost you everything. It would completely ruin your life. What would you do? The warm air enclosed her, so close she could catch a faint soapy smell coming from him. His eyes bored into hers, waiting, a tinge desperate. Cinder wet her mouth. Ruin my life to save a million others? It's not much of a choice. His lips parted. She had no choice but to look at them and then immediately back into his eyes. She could almost count the black lashes around them, but then a sadness filtered into his gaze. You're right, there's no real choice. Her body simultaneously yearned to close the gap between them and push him away. The anticipation that warmed her lips made it impossible to do either. Your Highness? She tilted her face toward him, the subtlest of movements. She listened to his wavering breath, and this time it was his eyes dropping to her lips. I'm sorry, he said. I'm sure this is horribly inappropriate, but it seems that my life is about to be ruined. Her brow drew together, questioning, but he didn't elaborate. His fingers, light as a breath, brushed her elbow. He craned his head. Cinder couldn't move, barely managing to wet her lips as her eyes slipped shut. Pain exploded in her head, raced down her spine. She fell to the ground in agony. Um, the thing that happened earlier with 
you know, the, her neck thing, it happened again. Kai takes Cinder to Dr. Erland and then gives him the antidote that Queen Lavana gave to him. Then he leaves and Cinder tells Dr. Erland that Queen Lavana saw her. And she's like, Dr. Erland, what the fuck? You told me I was a shell, but clearly I'm not. And he's like, you're right, you're not. So here's the thing, your adoptive father made this little device that would prevent a lunar from using their gift and simultaneously prevent lunars from being able to manipulate, you know, the person with the device. It's a lock on the lunar gift. He said that the reason that she keeps like having these exploding neck pains is because he overrode the device and Cinder is going to become a full on lunar now. So then because Dr. Erland has the antidote, Cinder's like, dude, you, you gotta give me some. I gotta take it to Peony. So she runs to Peony, but it's too late. Peony dies right before Cinder is about to like put the antidote to her lips. So she ends up giving it to Chang, Sasha's son. She then takes Peony's ID chip because she doesn't want these androids to like take it from her dead body. And then she causes a bit of a scene like these drones are coming after her and she doesn't know why, but it turns out Audrey sent them. She's grounding Cinder. She sees that Cinder has been going to the palace. She's been tracking her and she's like, Cinder, what the fuck are you doing? From now on, I'm taking your foot. She sold off Eco for spare parts and she's like, Cinder, you gotta do as I say. You're gonna stay at the market, stay in the basement. End of discussion. Cinder goes to the basement, sees that Eco's personality chip has been saved and she was like, thank God, because with the personality chip, like that's the essence of Eco. So now, um, Peony is dead. Eco is kind of like in a coma essentially until she gets a new body. Cinder is without a foot and she's being forced to work at the booth. Kai comes by again and he's like, why have you been ignoring me? And she's like, dude, my, my sister died, like all this shit. But she doesn't say that. She's like, oh, you know, I've been busy. He asks her to the ball one last time. She says no. He gives her these gloves as a gift and then Pearl comes by and she's like, oh my God, Cinder, why are you talking to the prince? So then Kai leaves and they both kind of think that it's the last time that they're gonna see each other. Kai then becomes coronated as the new emperor. And then randomly, the day of the ball, uh, Pearl and Audrey go, Cinder is left at home, and the decom link starts working. The person at the other end of the decom link is Cress. Cress is a <laughs> um, character in future books, but she's this hacker that's cooped up, that's imprisoned in space. Cress tells Cinder that Lavana knows that Prince Kai was searching for Princess Selene, and so Lavana has sent people after Princess Selene and everyone she was ever associated with. And then when Queen Lavana becomes Empress and marries Kai, she will kill Kai and then use her army on Luna to like wage war on Earth. So Cinder's like, holy shit, I gotta tell Kai. She puts on Peony's dress that Eco saved, the gloves that Kai gave to her, her old tiny metal foot, and uses the car she was going to escape with to drive to the ball. The car ends up getting wrecked on the way. Cinder is a mess, it's raining. She's like damp, covered in stains. They announce her into the ball as Kai's personal guest because to the last moment he had hoped that she would arrive. Cinder goes walking walking down the steps is about to meet Kai when Audrey interferes. She's about to slap Cinder silly when Kai stops her and then dances her away from the scene. They start flirting and because Cinder had seen Pearl talking with Kai earlier, she assumed that Pearl had told Kai that she's a cyborg and so Kai is like talking to her. He's like, why didn't you tell me? And this whole time Cinder's thinking, oh my God, it's about the cyborg thing when really it was about Peony's death. She ends up telling Kai everything that Crest told her, but even with that information, Kai's still like, I think I really do still have to marry Queen Lavana. Now here's where things really get wild. Before she knew what she was doing, she was storming after Kai. She grabbed his elbow and spun him back around to face her. Without hesitating, Cinder wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him. Kai froze, his body as tense as an androids against her, but his lips were soft and warm. Though Cinder had intended for it to be a short kiss, she found herself lingering. Hot tangles coursed through her body, surprising and scary, but not unpleasant, surging like electricity through her wires. This time they did not overwhelm her. This time they did not threaten to burn her from the inside out. The desperation melted and for the briefest of moments, the ulterior motives were gone. She found herself kissing him for no other reason than she wanted to. She wanted him to know that she wanted to. She didn't realize how badly she wanted Kai to kiss her back until it became quite clear that he wouldn't. Cinder pried herself away. Her hands lingered on his shoulders, still shaking from the new raw energy inside her. Kai gaped at her, lips left hanging open, and though Cinder's gut reaction was to back away and apologize profusely, she swallowed it down. Perhaps, she said, testing her voice before raising it loud enough that she was sure the crowd would hear her, perhaps the queen will not accept your proposal once she finds out you're already in love with me. Kai's eyebrows rose higher. Wah? Beside him, the advisor took in a hissing breath and a series of gasps and rustles passed through the crowd. It occurred to Cinder that the music had stopped again as the musicians stood and tried to get a look at what was happening. 
A burst of jovial, tittering laughs split through the awkwardness. The sound, though filled with the sweetness of a child's giggle, sent a chill down Cinder's spine. Pulling her hands away from Kai's neck, she slowly turned. The crowd followed the noise as well, swiveling in unison like puppets on strings. And there was Queen Lavana. How charmingly naive, said the queen, followed by another spill of laughter. You must misunderstand my culture. On Luna, we consider monogamy to be nothing more than archaic sentimentality. What do I care if my husband-to-be is in love with another? She paused, her dark eyes sweeping over Cinder's dress. Woman. Terror wrapped around Cinder's throat as the queen's eyes seemed to pierce right through her. The queen knew she was Luna, she could tell. What does concern me, continued Queen Lavana, her voice a sweet lullaby that sharpened with her next words, is that it appears my betrothed has fallen in love with an insignificant shell. Am I mistaken? Lavana quirked one slender eyebrow. Her glittering eyes surpassed Kai, staring into Cinder with a gaze both beautiful and cruel. Warmth was building in Cinder's spine, steady and growing hot. She feared a meltdown. The pain would come and she would collapse and be useless. Well, Cinder, said Queen Lavana, swirling the pale wine, it seems you've been keeping secrets from your royal superiors. Do you wish to refute my claim? Kai turned to her, and she could sense his desperation, even if she couldn't look at him. She focused only on the queen, her jaw aching with hatred. She was glad that no tears would betray her humiliation, glad that no blood in her cheeks would betray her anger, glad that her hateful cyborg body was good for one thing as she clutched onto her shredded dignity. She leveled her glare at the queen. Her retina display began to panic, noticing her increased levels of adrenaline, her racing pulse. Warnings were flashing before her, but she ignored them, surprisingly calm. If I had not been brought to Earth, she said, I would be a slave under your rule. I will not apologize apologize for escaping. In the corner of her gaze, she saw Kai's face fall, eyes widening as the truth became undeniable. He had been courting a lunar. So then Lavana's like, all right, Kai, here's a little game. Either I take Cinder or you marry me. And so Kai's like, take Cinder. <laughs> but then during this whole thing, Cinder, her little like cyborg interface is working and she can see what Lavana truly looks like. And then she's like, oh my God, you're not beautiful. And she says this aloud and everybody is so flabbergasted, including Lavana. So the queen almost makes Cinder shoot herself in front of everybody, but her system and her new lunar gift allowed her to fight it. She like didn't pull the trigger in her head, but like instead pointing the gun at the ceiling and shot it. And then once her full lunar gift was like present, showing itself, the queen was like, oh my God, that's my niece. And then Cinder realizing she had control over her own body again, immediately pointed the gun at Lavana and shot. A guard took a bullet for Lavana though so nothing happened but then cinder ran outside fell down the steps her foot came off in the process and then kai saw her for everything that she was kai stole down the remaining stairs until he stood on the pathway before her it seemed he had to force himself to meet her gaze and he flinched at first Cinder could not read him, the ever-changing mix of disbelief and confusion and regret. His chest was heaving. He tried to speak twice before words would come, quiet words that would never leave Cinder's head. Was it all an illusion? he asked. Pain laced through her chest, squeezing the air out of her. Kai? Was it all in my head? A lunar trick? Her stomach twisted. No. She shook her head, fervently. How to explain that she hadn't had the gift before, that she couldn't have used it against him? I would never lie. Her, the words faded. She had lied. Everything he knew about her had been a lie. I'm so sorry, she finished, the words falling lamely into the open air. Kai peeled his eyes away, finding some place of resignation off in the glistening garden. You're even more painful to look at than she is. Damn! As they took Cinder away into the prison cell, Kai took the foot from off of the ground and kept it, like Cinder's metal foot. There's an understanding among everyone that once Cinder gets taken back to Luna, she will be killed but Kai has been buying her some time anyway, and Queen Lavana agrees not to wage war on Earth yet. So then at the very end, Dr. Erlen comes by Cinder's cell. He uses his glamour to get in to the cell. Cinder's like, what are you doing here? And Dr. Erlen's like, girl, you're gonna meet me in Africa. He gives her a new hand and a new foot. She's like, what are you even talking about? He's like, don't like ask me any questions. Don't think about it, just escape from jail and then go to Africa. And she's like, why? And he's like, girl, you're Princess Selene. And so Cinder, she starts like having a panic attack. She's like, oh my God, what on earth? Kai has been searching for me this whole time. The cyborg draft was also for me. All those cyborgs died because of me. He's like, don't worry, girl. We're gonna try and reinstate you as queen. And she's like, we're gonna do what now? Anyway, he leaves. She's still like kind of having a crisis, but she has a plan of what she needs to do. She's gonna try and escape from jail and her first step is cutting out her own ID chip. And that's where the book ends. Dude, it's so good. Like this whole thing, like reading it again for the 15th time, 
was just as good as the first. Let me know if you want me to do the other books. We could take a trip down memory lane together. Don't forget also to download Toon Blast for free now using the link in my description or in the pinned comment. Or again, by scanning this QR code to receive three hours of unlimited lives and a hundred free coins. Thank you guys so much for joining me and I will see you next time. Bye.